A significant road widening project earns the support of the City Council. Residents weigh in on what should be done with open spaces throughout Durham's urban core, and the City's youngest workers make a big impression on potential employers. We invite you to join us now as we take you inside City Hall this week. Hello, I'm Amy Blaylock. Welcome to City Hall this week, dedicated to keeping you informed about what's going on inside Durham City Hall. The city administration now has guidelines in place to help prioritize how your tax dollars will be spent as part of next year's budget. The city council adopted those budget development guidelines during its March 21st meeting. Because overall city revenue growth is projected to remain flat next year, increases in city spending must continue to be limited. Through the guidelines, the City Council is directing the City Manager to develop a budget that limits increases to what is needed to accommodate population growth and cost factors. It also clearly identifies funding requirements driven by state and federal mandates and major city initiatives. Some of the highlights of the guidelines include a potential property tax rate increase will be considered for increases in debt service cost. Funding for the non-city agency program will not be included in the budget. $150,000 will help fund agencies that support homelessness and homelessness prevention services. And $437,000 will be committed over four years to complete existing housing activities in southwest central Durham and northeast central Durham. A public hearing on the proposed budget will be held on June 6th. The North Carolina Department of Transportation's plans to widen Highway 55 or Alston Avenue will soon be moving forward with the City Council's support. Under the proposed project, the highway would be widened to a four-lane median divided roadway between the Durham Freeway and Highway 98 or Holloway Street. Uh, it would have uh, a landscape median, wide outside lanes for bicycles, uh, and sidewalks on both sides of the street. Council members gave their approval to the proposal because it uses a revised alignment, preserving the Los Primos grocery store located at Main Street and Austin Avenue. The original alignment uh, required widening the street more on the uh, western side, and it required the taking of the Los Primos grocery store and demolition of the store. Uh, subsequent to that, NCDOT did a study that found that taking the store would be an environmental justice issue meaning it would have a disproportionately high and adverse impact on minority and low-income populations. Uh, the study found that uh, many of the customers of Los Primos couldn't easily get to other stores, they didn't have cars, uh, and Los Primos offered services and products that weren't easily available at other uh, stores in the area. So NCDOT then created a, a revised alignment that widened more on the east side of the street that did not require the taking of the store. The shift to preserve the grocery store will mean, however, that the road widening will impact the Durham Rescue Mission's property. Revised alignment that widens more on the east side of the street requires taking some of the Durham Rescue Mission's property, including two buildings that are currently used for storage. Um, since it's only taking a, a portion of the property and not the, the major center of, of operations there, it's not considered to be an environmental justice issue. Despite the impact it will have on area properties, transportation planners say the road widening project is important for Durham. Alston Avenue is over capacity currently. Um, also, the, the accident rate is six times the statewide average for similar facilities. So the, the purpose of the project is to add capacity and improve safety. The proposed project passes through the Hope 6 revitalization area and is expected to result in the relocation of 19 homes, four businesses, one nonprofit, and two apartment buildings. The project will be paid for by federal and state funds. The city will be responsible for half of the cost of any new sidewalks and the cost of other enhancements to the project. There are more developments to report on the extension of Carver Street in Northeast Durham.
The City Council approved a $650,000 engineering design services contract for the project. The road will be extended by one mile from its current intersection with Danube Lane to Old Oxford Highway and Hamblin Road. The engineering design services will include construction plans, required permits, bid documents and construction management for the project. A major reconstruction and resurfacing project on Revere Road is already underway, meaning the entire length of the road will be closed to through traffic over the next four months. The closure is needed for the city to completely reconstruct seven sections of the road, repave it and replace approximately 9,000 feet of curb and many driveway connections. Electronic message boards and other signage is being used to let Parkwood residents know about established detour routes within the community. Other motorists should use alternative routes indicated on electronic message boards on Highway 54 and Sedwick Road. Triangle Transit wants to make sure it's serving Durham Area Transit Authority or DATA customers in the best way possible. An onboard customer satisfaction survey will be conducted to identify who the actual DATA clients are and determine how to best communicate with them and evaluate the quality of the current services. A state grant will provide $52,000 toward the cost of the survey. Durham's portion of the project cost is $12,000. The city, in collaboration with Chapel Hill Transit and Triangle Transit, will also use transportation grant funds to help keep better track of exactly how many people are using the bus system. The grant will provide nearly $79,000 of the $98,000 needed to buy automatic passenger counting devices. Durham will have to pay a local match of $19,000. Automatic passenger counting devices, popularly called APCs, are devices, they are basically sensors that are put on the buses to accurately count people who are boarding and deboarding buses. Data currently collects passenger information primarily through the fare collection device, which is meant to track fare collection and not passenger counts. To some extent, to a very large degree, they are okay, but every now and then we need operator intervention. And when this is not accurately done, it actually compromises the integrity of the whole counting process. These APCs have very little intervention. To address that need, 30 devices will be installed on the fixed route buses to ensure that more accurate counts of passengers are made. We need accurate ridership count because it tells us how well we are doing. Our number one performance measure is ridership. Also, we receive a lot of subsidies from the federal government and from the state government, even from the city. I mean, unfortunately, one of the key issues that we need to make sure we have is the ridership, because it's a good measure of how much subsidy that we're going to be receiving. Also, um, internally, it helps us to know how well we need to make adjustments to routes, to equipment, basically the no level of supply that we have to have there to accommodate the ridership. The 30 new devices will be in addition to the units the city has already installed on five data buses. Transportation planners want to make sure that getting around by foot or bike is also an option for as many people as possible. Find out how changes to the Durham Walks pedestrian plan are expected to help make that vision a reality when City Hall This Week continues. Yeah, I'm almost there. I just got to find that cross street. Whoa! Stop! Solid Waste Collection employees have the fifth highest fatality rate in the United States. But there are other people who care about them. He's my husband. He's my brother. He's my dad. He's my son. Be alert. Watch the road and slow down to get around. This message is brought to you by the National Solid Waste Management Association and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration.
Welcome back. The Durham Walks pedestrian plan is continuing to blaze the trail for making Durham a more pedestrian friendly city. Well, the Durham Walks pedestrian plan is a comprehensive plan aimed at improving uh, the walkability of Durham. It looked at where sidewalks were needed, where sidewalk repairs were needed, looked at our existing policies and made recommendations for improving those. And so it's just an overall plan to improve the uh, walkability of Durham. The City Council received an update and then approved changes to the plan during its March 21st meeting. Since the plan was adopted in 2006, uh, we've uh, built about 19 miles of new sidewalk. We've made repairs to about 10,000 uh, feet of sidewalk uh, that was identified as being in, in poor condition. And we've put in uh, curb ramps uh, at intersections and have also put in pedestrian signals at, uh, at many intersections. Last year we installed pedestrian signals at about 13 intersections around the city. The update and changes also address primary concerns and questions raised by council members regarding how the plan is being implemented. We provided a status report uh, both last year and this year to the city council on the progress that's, me that's being made. Uh, the city council is very interested in making Durham a more walkable community and so they just want to uh, hear from us regularly on the progress that's being made. Uh, there have been some bond funds allocated to sidewalk construction. They want to know, you know what, uh, how those bond funds are being used and the progress uh, being made to, uh, to spend those funds. And also want to have uh, questions about uh, safety uh, of our uh, pedestrians, what we're doing to try to improve safety, uh, what we're doing to improve uh, pedestrian access to to the bus system and, and bus stops. The City Council also asked about uh, petition sidewalks. Those are sidewalks where residents uh, sign a petition requesting that the sidewalk be built and the progress that's being made on those uh, sidewalk construction projects. The report that was recently provided to Council provided updates on the funding uh, picture. It also listed the sidewalk projects that are under construction that have already been completed as well as those that are in the design phase. One of the significant issues affecting the implementation of the plan is funding, clearly impacting the rate at which the sidewalks can be built. There are four primary sources of sidewalk construction in the city. Uh, one is the bond funds. Those are uh, uh, funds that are approved by the voters and uh, for sidewalk construction. A second source is sidewalks that are built um, as development occurs, so uh, developers uh, typically are required to build new sidewalk as part of their construction. Uh, a third source of funding is uh, federal funds that we receive through NCDOT or, or through the uh, Durham Chapel Hill Carborough MPO that are allocated to the city for sidewalk construction. And then the fourth way sidewalks get built is, is as part of road construction projects. So when a road is being built or a road is being widened, uh, we will typically um, also build new sidewalk at that time. The plan recommended about 170 miles of new sidewalks in the city and since the plan was adopted about five years ago we've built uh, about 19 miles so at that rate it's going to take uh, probably more than 40 years to build all the sidewalks that are recommended in the plan. It is important to note that the plan looks at a number of factors when ranking where new sidewalks are needed. Those factors are, are include the amount of sidewalk that's existing along a certain street, uh, the type of street that is, whether it's an arterial street, a collector, or a neighborhood street. It also looks at several uh, land use uh, factors, such as are there parks along the street, are there schools, are there uh, businesses or other attractors. Uh, are there existing trails that the sidewalk would connect to? Uh, it also looked at safety, uh, where are there, uh, have there been a lot of pedestrian crashes along the street, and whether there is transit 
along the street. So it looks at a lot of different factors to rank uh, the sidewalk needs. The council uh, requested that we give a higher, a little bit higher priority to uh, sidewalks near schools and near parks and recreation centers. So we've incorporated that into the ranking methodology. More information about the sidewalks that are in the process of being constructed and those that are finished can be found on the Public Works homepage on the city's website. The city is also beginning the process of developing Durham's first ever urban open space plan. The urban open space plan is a policy and guidance document for the preservation and enhancement of open space in Durham's downtown urban core. An open house was held on March 9th to start gathering public input for development of the plan. City staff wants to hear how residents and visitors live, work and play in between downtown's buildings. I think it needs to be intentional. So we need to have a plan that designs the built environment. Just like an architectural plan for a building, we need to have an urban plan for open space throughout the city. I'd like to see a connection between the urban spaces, open spaces, so that they're all connected and part of a bigger system, not isolated separate spaces. Uh, I'd like to see a connection to the buildings that are around them so that we have well-defined urban spaces. And I'd like to see variety, density, scale, texture, color, a mix of hardscape and landscape, that kind of thing. I think an urban open space plan is needed in Durham because Durham has a lot of potential um, but could really increase its amenities downtown by having more places for people to relax and recreate. And if you look at other cities around the country, like Greensboro and Norfolk, these are cities that are also working towards these types of amenities. So I think it's, it really will help Durham stand out um, if they increase their open space uh, amenities downtown. The public feedback will allow planners to ensure that Durham's open space can serve several important functions. Durham's been um, developing fairly rapidly in the downtown area, and we have a lot of um, portions in the compact neighborhood and the urban tiers um, and in the downtown core and we as planning staff and citizens of Durham felt like there needed to be an established plan so we could clearly identify where these areas are that we need to maintain and or enhance with respect to open space for the public. Several more open houses will be held in the coming weeks and months to generate ideas for the plan. Depending on the input received, there may be recommendations to amend the Unified Development Ordinance regarding open space provisions in the downtown, compact neighborhood, and urban tiers. The historic Durham Athletic Park can now be seen in a whole new light. The ballpark will be illuminated this season with $150,000 worth of donated new metal highlight lights. The lights, which were donated by minor league baseball sponsor Musco Lighting, will provide 70-foot candles of lighting in the infield and 50-foot candles of lighting in the outfield. The city's general services department paid for the installation of the lights at a cost of $49,000. The new lights are expected to make the field more usable by more groups. An effort to make many of the city's facilities more energy efficient is picking up steam. Find out how this energy saving project is also expected to save some big bucks when City Hall This Week continues. What we do to the planet, we do to ourselves. You can help keep America beautiful. Visit kab.org. Uh, hello. Uh, yes. Can I ask a few questions about the apartment on Park Street? What was your name? Is my name. Uh, my name is Juan Hernandez. It's been rented. Oh, it's gone. Hello. My name is Sanjay Kumar. I am calling about the apartment on Park Street. It's not available. Not available? Hello. My name is Tyrone Washington. I'm calling about the apartment on Park Street. Just been rented. Hello, I am Chen Ling. My name is Khalid Bin Ali. I'm Tuan Vo. Hello, my name is Moshe Goldberg. I use a wheelchair. It's gone. Not available. All right. Thank you. Yes, hello, my name is Graham Wellington. I'm calling about the apartment for rent on Park Street. Is that still available? Yes, it is. What oh, is? Yes. Really? Housing discrimination is illegal. If you think you've been a victim because of your race, color, national origin, sex, religion, disability, or family status, call us. Fair housing. It's not an option. It's the law.
Welcome back. An important energy savings project is underway for a number of city facilities. During its March 10th work session, the City Council learned what the goals of the Guaranteed Energy Savings Contract or Performance Contracting are. And the main objectives of this process are to reduce energy use, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, reduce operating costs, and improve building performance. Performance contracting is considered to be a cost-effective way of achieving these goals. All of the payments for the project would come from energy savings realized through the improvements. The general idea behind this is that we would hire a contractor, a specialized contractor who would come and evaluate particular facilities looking for energy and water savings. And we would contract with them to conduct those um, upgrades uh, in a one year span. They would have one year to do all the upgrades on those facilities. We would finance that process and then we would pay back that financing out of the savings that we see on our utility bills where we save energy and water. And those savings are guaranteed by the contractor. If we don't see the savings that they say we will, they pay the difference. While there are a number of buildings that would benefit from the improvements, nine city facilities are being evaluated for the project. We picked facilities that were larger in size that have no scheduled renovations currently, uh, that have above energy or water use, and that the city pays the utility bills. So our nine facilities are the City Hall and the Annex, that's our largest electrical usage in the city. Uh, fire Station Number 2 that was built in 1950, there's some improvements there that we can make. Uh, the Public Works Operating Center down on Martin Luther King, we're looking at air conditioning and lighting and water savings opportunities there. Uh, the General Services Building, uh, Solid Waste Offices and Fleet Management all have air conditioning controls and lighting improvements there. Uh, the Miss Lake Water Management Facility um, has uh, lighting and air conditioning controls opportunities. Uh, the fire administration complex, all four buildings there on that complex are being looked at. And at the North Durham Water Reclamation Facility, we're looking at exterior lighting and air conditioning controls in the office building. We're not looking at any of the process controls there. Actual construction and energy upgrades are expected to begin in January of 2012. If you want to find out more about what your family can do to save energy or take part in other sustainability efforts, you'll want to make sure and mark Sunday, May 1st on your calendar now. That's when Durham's 2011 Earth Day Festival will be held from noon until 5 p.m. at Durham Central Park. If you go, be prepared to participate in green activities and demonstrations, to learn about green practices and products at the Sustainability Expo and Earth Art Market, and of course, to enjoy great music and food. For more information about this year's Earth Day Festival, visit the Parks and Recreation homepage on the city's website. And speaking of recycling at its best, the city is making sure that even old tree stumps are being put to good use. Find out how when City Hall This Week continues. Hi, I'm Chief Jose Lopez with the Durham Police Department. Everyone knows in times of an emergency to call 911. But what about during a non-emergency like these? So you want to report a barking dog? Loud music? Call 560-4600. This 24-7 number was established by the Durham 911 Center for all non-emergency calls. Immediate threat to your life or property, call 911. And all other non-emergency calls? 560-4600. Now you got it. For every one of these spots, there are at least 5 to 24 others for you to use. Many folks think that people with disabilities are getting special treatment with these parking spaces. But it's really a safety issue, not a convenience. Many drivers backing out of a parking space can't see a person with a disability. Remember, accessible parking is a civil right built on safety. For more information, call the Americans with Disabilities Act Information Center at 800-949-4232. Welcome back. If you're interested in helping to stop sexual violence on college and university campuses, the city and its partners want to hear from you. A conference called Bridging the Gaps, a focus on innovations, will be held on Saturday, April 2nd. It will take place from 8.30 a.m. until 4.30 p.m. at the Holton Career and Resource Center. The conference is free to attend, but registration is required. To register, visit the website listed on your screen or call the Human Relations Department at 560-4107.
Hundreds of Durham's young people will once again be given the opportunity to develop work experience and skills this summer, thanks to the Mayor's Summer Youth Work Program. The Mayor's Summer Youth Work Program is an, a work program that we offer job opportunities for youth between the ages of 14 and 21. They work for a six to eight week period in various positions all over the city of Durham. This job fair and career expo was held on March 9th to give youth a chance to meet potential employers and find out what opportunities will be available for the summer. The purpose of the job fair is to both share opportunities of employment and also career development. So some people, uh, for the young people especially, 14 to 15 year old, the jobs are very limited. So beside the fact that we're sharing job opportunities and the turn in applications, uh, we are also sharing career opportunities and volunteer opportunities. We strive for the citizens of the city of Durham to also be volunteers in the city of Durham. So it's both for employment, for volunteer opportunities, and also to share career development opportunities. Approximately 300 summer employment opportunities are available this year for young people ages 14 to 21. While the application deadline for participants has already passed, the program is still looking for opportunities to partner with area businesses. Participants will begin work on June 13th and work until August 22nd. City of Durham employees and the Museum of Life and Science are working together to enhance the quality of life for the animals living at the museum. As you'll see in this We Care segment, it's a relatively small effort reaping tremendous results. As the director of Keep Durham Beautiful, I have to work with urban forestry a lot. What they do is so important. Uh, all the tree maintenance needs in the city, uh, throughout the parks, city right of way, streets. Uh, we prune, remove, uh, plant, water, mulch. Um, any tree problem or issue that you have in the city of Durham, that's, we take care of it for you. Uh, there's a lot of individuals and a lot of groups that want, want wood or wood products and they want to see it reused. This was an opportunity for us to, one, get rid of the wood that we would have to pay to dispose of and, and put it back out where the public can enjoy it. Most people, that's the one part of the tree they do not want is the stump. But uh, when we found out what they were for, it was a pretty unique idea, so we're more than happy to help. I just thought that was such a cool idea. And the fact that the Museum of, of Life and Science can use those with their animals, and it just benefits so many different layers of people. Oh, the animals need the stumps because we're always trying to be creative in our enrichment strategies with them. The bears have a wonderful exhibit with waterfalls and rocks and deadfall and, and grass to dig in. But the stumps seem like something that we're really a, a, a new and unique opportunity to get a whole bunch in to create little climbing structures for the bears to play on. I think it's, it's a win-win on, on both accounts, certainly for us. It provides us a way to get rid of the heaviest portion of our wood to a museum that's, that's putting it out there that the public can actually enjoy. The animals have really, it seems that they've enjoyed the stumps. The bears uh, spend time walking around them, chasing each other through them, climbing on top of them. Our steer will jump and rub against his and push his. Same goes for the donkey and goats too. Oh, I thought it was, it was awesome to have the, the chance to actually take something over for the animals, you know, to have something to do. Well, we couldn't have gotten the stumps without the city. There's absolutely no way that we could move, let alone find stumps of this size. So the fact that they were able to gather up as much as we wanted and deliver them exactly where we needed them, uh, we can't say thanks enough from us and the animals here. It makes you feel needed, <laughs> but uh, you know, I didn't do it on my own. I've got six guys down there that they, they're there anytime you need them. They do whatever it is and they're six of the best tree guys that you'll ever come across in your life. That does it for this edition of City Hall This Week. Be sure and visit DTV8 on Facebook and Twitter to find out how you can tune into this show, City Life, and all the city's programming. You can also find us on demand on the city's website at durhamnc.gov DTV8. I'm Amy Blaylock. Thank you for joining us for City Hall This Week.